The summer of 1864 was the North's darkest hour. Grant's losses had been appalling. His army was stalled in front of Petersburg. His grand strategy apparently come to nothing. Franz Siegel's army had been routed in the Shenandoah. Ben Butler was bottled up in a loop of the James River called the Bermuda Hundred. Even William Tecumseh Sherman was stalled outside Atlanta. Mr. Lincoln is already beaten. He cannot be reelected, and we must have another ticket. Horace Greeley. No nation had ever held an election in the midst of a civil war. No president since Andrew Jackson had won a second term. Long after Lincoln was nominated, politicians in his own party still hoped to reconvene and pick another nominee. Even Lincoln believed his re-election unlikely. We cannot have free government without elections. And if the rebellion could force us to forego or postpone a national election, it might fairly be claimed to have already conquered and ruined us. Abraham Lincoln. After four years of failure to restore the Union by the experiment of war, we demand that immediate effort be made for a cessation of hostilities at the earliest practicable moment. Democratic National Platform. The Democrats wanted an end to the war, with or without victory. Their nominee was General George McClellan, whose ambition had not shrunk since Lincoln removed him from command. McClellan was our first commander, and as such, he was almost worshipped by his soldiers. The political friends of General McClellan well understood that fact, and it was a very crafty thing for them to nominate him as their candidate for the presidency. The South rejoiced at McClellan's nomination, the first ray of real light, Vice President Alexander Stevens said, since the war began. Wherever it could, the South exploited anti-war feeling in the North. The Confederate government sent money to support the Union peace movement and painted Lincoln as the candidate of war. The campaign was ugly. Democrats charged that the real goal of old Abe's war was miscegenation, a new word for the blending of white and black. Republicans charged Democrats with treason. The 1864 presidential election had become a referendum on the war itself. All the word from all Republicans, even on the lo most local level, indicated that Lincoln couldn't possibly win. The fortunes of war had turned too badly, too sour for the Union. At one really poignant moment, Lincoln sat in the privacy of his office contemplating the fact that he probably wasn't going to be reelected and that McClellan, of all people, would replace him as president. This morning, as for some days past, it seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Then it will be my duty to so cooperate with the president-elect as to save the union between the election and the inauguration as he will have secured his election on such ground that he cannot possibly save it afterward. Pressured to drop emancipation as a condition of peace with the South, Lincoln refused. The proclamation had promised freedom, Lincoln said, and the promise being made must be kept. I should be damned in time and in eternity. If I were to return to slavery, the black warriors who have fought for the Union. Spy Johnson shot near Coffin. Even before Bull Run, stolen secrets and intricate codes streamed between Washington and Richmond. Alan Pinkerton ran the Northern Secret Service, 
while Confederate Major William Norris had a spy network that extended as far north as Montreal. In 1864, several Southern agents even invaded Vermont. Spies were everywhere. Women who come before the public are in a bad box now. All manner of things they say come over the border under the huge hoops now worn. So they are ruthlessly torn off. Not legs, but arms are looked for under hoops. And sad to say, found. Mary Chestnut. Rose O'Neill Greenow, a Washington widow, ran a Confederate spy ring just a few blocks from the White House. Much of her information came from an infatuated suitor, Senator Henry Wilson, chairman of the Military Affairs Committee. Imprisonment failed to stop Bell Boyd from coaxing secrets out of Union officers in Washington and passing them on in code to Richmond inside rubber balls that she tossed from her cell window to a shadowy agent she knew only as C.H. Her admirers called her La Belle Rebelle. Slaves and former slaves made especially good Union operatives, guiding Northern troops through swamps and forests and reporting on their masters. After all, one Union officer said, they had been spies all their lives. One Northern agent, a black servant named Mary Elizabeth Bowser, even worked inside the Confederate White House. In November of 1863, a Southern courier 